Thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Write Project podcast and radio program. This is a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew, author of such novels as Touch Your Nose and Jacoby Street and founder of Engine Books. Let's see what we have today. Uh, well, welcome to another fine episode of the show. We are here this time with Travis House of Houseless Poetry, author of books like Peace Be the Journey and All I Brought Back. He is a very, very storied traveler throughout this great country. He has written many books about his experiences traveling the country and, and poems and such like that. Very like the definition of, of indie author and indie poet. You can often see him at the St. John's Farmer's Market on an old typewriter typing away and uh, and, and producing his, his works of poetry live, his art live. Thank you for joining us, Travis. A uh, pleasure. Thanks for having me. No worries. No worries. Uh, tell me a bit about your uh, your art and how you you kind of found yourself on this journey a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah. So I uh, spent a great deal of my time hitchhiking uh, Canada the past six, seven years, I guess. And uh, I used to busk with my mandolin to keep my uh, adventures going, keep uh, the money flowing, as you will. But uh, there's also a part of me that was sort of desperate to share these stories I'd uh, end up collecting. Uh, you know, just hitchhiking is such a story based thing. You're being shoved, people's stories are being shoved down your throat the whole time. So uh, I started writing poetry about it. And then it occurred to me I could set up in a park and just write poetry in a park rather than, uh, rather than you know, play some music. So yeah, it was uh, really was just a drive to tell stories and then it was a drive to feed myself. And uh, so I set up, the very first time I set up actually was uh, there in the pedestrian mall, the very first year we had that here in St. John's. And I was like, all right, well, before I do this next travel, like this big next trip, let me see if it actually works. So I set up uh, down there and was met with such overwhelming support financially and emotionally that I was like, oh, I think I might have something here. Like this oh, might yeah. be one of the most unique and uh, lucrative things I, or like ideas I may have ever had. Well, like it's, it's something that's, it is unique. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like it's one thing to be able to like play a song at will and stuff like that. And kind of, that kind of like on the spot entertainment that, that buskers do kind of thing, that very unique experience is one thing, but it's, it, not every writer can just be given a topic and write a coherent piece of art on it on the spot, Travis. That's not perhaps. <laughs> you know, perhaps like, I, I think that most writers wouldn't let themselves because they're already too hypercritical of their own writing and self-conscious and riddled with. I mean, we are all riddled with neuroses, but like I don't like everything that I put out there in those things. Obviously, some of them are. Uh, you know, I know what I feel about everything. So if someone asks me to write a poem about a fire truck, I have something in my head about what I feel about a fire truck. Sure. But uh, it's this action of turning my brain off and just letting the automatic writing technique kind of take over. And usually it's passable. You know, I mean, I guess most people would say it's all passable. They're very kind, but it's uh, it's this kind of thoughtless thoughtlessness or thoughtful thoughtlessness yeah. <laughs> or something i don't know how to describe it no it's great it's great you're able to like tap into the muse right there on command which is amazing skill to have like it's it's something i advocate like like i i get fundamentally upset at authors who people who say they're writers and don't spend any time writing you know what i mean it's like <laughs> come on man like what you doing yeah, it's a it's a hell of a practice, and it's more it's such a ritual thing as well. You know, once I sit down at that uh, that table, it, it's almost like a hyper focus or something. Once people start showing up, you know. Well, that's wonderful, Travis. Travis, if you were trapped on a desert island and could only take three books or movies uh, with you to keep you company for the rest of time, what would they be? Dharma Bums, Jack Kerouac. They'd all be books, by the way. 
Dharma Bums Kerouac, I'd probably take Hatchet, <laughs> my favorite childhood book of all time. Okay. And uh, let's see, Dharma Bums and uh, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Okay. No one ever thinks about practical things. Like, you got to take The Stand by Stephen King because it's a lot of pages and you'll need to burn them to stay alive. Right. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. I'm, uh, the desert island is kind of a problem. There is no uh, no birch bark to really get your fire going, hey. Uh, who inspired you to start your business, if any other person did? I don't know if anyone really did. It, like, it was kind of a desperation thing. It was, uh, I've kind of lived in you know, relative poverty my whole life and kind of dug it and kind of took a vow of poverty, what I called a vow of poverty when I was like 19 and swore that I would not chase money and I'd only chase experiences. So I chased money long enough to send me to Europe for a few months alone. And that was when I was a kid and I've I've been chasing that ever since. So it was, uh, yeah, I don't know if... uh, Are you Spider-Man? (laughs) <laughs> no because no, like I, it sounds very much like that vow of po- uh, poverty and it, like it's like oh i'm only gonna do experience sounds a lot like what you're saying is action is your reward uh yeah well absolutely it's it's experience life for me is um finite of course like it is for everyone but i think about death every single day and i make sure i think about death every single day to keep me on track and uh to just do the right thing and sometimes that means uh well my youth that meant not chasing money and some abject idea of success and just filling my soul with experiences until i thought of something better all right all right all right i like it i like it if you were a jam what kind of jam would you be oof good question probably like blueberry blueberry why probably blueberry because they're like, they don't pop out on the branch as much. You know what I mean? You, you can tell a strawberry or a raspberry on a branch. But sometimes you got to look a little closer for the blueberries. I feel like that's a little bit more of me. I like it. That's cool. <laughs> cool. Travis, how did you select the name for your business, Houseless Poetry? Uh, I also, that came as a kind of a nickname I ended up with while I was traveling. And uh, I kind of started a YouTube channel because I also made a like a two hour long hitchhiking uh, video, Um, Newfoundland to BC, every ride, every time, every camp spot, everything, filmed the whole thing and called the YouTube channel houseless. And then uh, I just kind of kept it because it was just too good. It worked with my last name. It worked with my kind of ethos. It's just kind of like made for me. (laughs) Oh yeah, no, it it definitely does. It's, it's, it's to the point where like you'd think that it wasn't your, your, Burke name you know what i mean like it's like, yeah. so good you know what i mean there you go. yeah i just kind of stumbled upon it travis do you read any reviews of your work and if so how do you deal with good ones or bad ones mentally i mean uh no i haven't read i don't know if anyone has reviewed my work at all anyone who's read it has been just kind and come up and tell me they they dig it but uh i tend to not put any weight into what other people think of pretty much anything there are some respected figures i would listen to but for the most part yeah (laughs) Yeah, but for the most part like especially with poetry and i also tell this to people like people don't get to tell you if your poetry is bad yeah sorry but they don't your poetry is your poetry it's an extension of your soul and they can not like the way you structure your sentences they can think that the words you choose are bland but doesn't matter they don't get to say nothing about it and yeah, i mean exactly. they, they can but yeah. try not to internalize it well i know uh, a certain nine-year-old girl that has a bunch of your poems like framed <laughs> in wrote it like in in rose gold frames on her wall and that means more to me than any critic review you could possibly you know find me <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah uh does your work energize you or does it exhaust you when you're when you're writing does it does it kind of pump you up and at the end of like you've got this yeah creative energy or is it just draining you know that's that is a good question most days it's it's energizing but it's not to the point where i go home and write it does kind of shag up my writing for the rest of the day because there's just like there's no way i could go home and start working on my own projects after a day at the market uh, but 
the only times I'm drained is when there are multiple markets in a row. Like Christmas time is crazy. Like my I'm brain dead and I'm worried about what people are actually getting on the paper because I don't remember any of the poems I write anyway for people, but much less so when I'm like six hours into a you know one of those big markets at the uh whatever one of those stadiums or something. Yeah. So it's uh it's it's both. Most most farmers markets I come home with a huge smile on my face, but if there's like a double market at the end of Sunday, <laughs> I'm pretty brain dead. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. It's uh it takes a lot showing up for people like that. Some people really come at you with some heavy stuff too. It's not like everybody wants uh poems about their grandma's birthday. There's some pretty heavy, really vulnerable things that people trust me with that uh yeah. are the ones that I'm most excited for, but are also the ones that take the most out of me. <laughs> but yeah, I love them. Right. So what does success look like for you? Success is just a good choice every day for me. I mean, that's what I strive for. It's one little good choice that brings me closer to uh, some sort of equanimity or some sort of uh, peace that I can share. Um, I mean, economically speaking, eventually it's looking like some sort of self-sustainability, move out of the city. I try to, you know, grow some vegetables, try to get back into hunting, do the whole, you know, self-sustainable racket because, uh, yeah, it's civilization uh, is not showing hopeful signs for me. It doesn't look like it has a place for me. <laughs> so I feel, yeah, I'm a little bit of going off the grid, evade, uh, evade the tornado type of thing. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Like, like it. Um, you're, you're going to be one of those reclusive people we read about where it's like, oh, he's put out another book. Everybody come grab it. I wonder what he thinks. And meanwhile, you yeah. go in your like, it's like, I, what I love is that I know you kind of, you know what I mean? Like we've I've, yeah. like, think we've become friends and stuff like that. And I picture you becoming a reclusive writer and everyone in the community going like, oh my God, Travis Houseless put, Houseless put out a new book. Let's read it and like <laughs> to figure out what he thinks. And I'll just be in the back of like the writer's retreat giggling like a schoolgirl because like I'll know that if we could like like do a zip zoom to you or zip cut to you in your little bunker, read like what you're thinking like and see into your head, it'd just be the Meow Mix commercial. Like just, <laughs> yeah. just nothing. <laughs> It's just uh, how much wood do I have to cut today? That's yeah. all I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. Travis, if you could tell your younger self, uh, your younger artist self, any one thing, what would it be? Share it. Share it for sure. Share it as quickly as possible and hold no um, attachment to it once it's out there. It's no longer yours. Like, see how people feel about it. You never know. Um, I've been incredibly blessed by messages and people who have told me my whole, I mean, adult life because of kind of how I've been living that they're inspired by me. and want to do, want to do what you do when I'm just so scared or, Oh, I got this job or I got all that stuff that makes my eyes roll because it's just excuses and they know it's excuses and I'm just human. I'm not special. I just made choices that brought me here and everyone's capable of choices. So it's share your writing, share your passion. Don't hold on to it. It's not yours after you let it go. And hopefully you can bring some more people along the way and show people there's much more to life than, you know, this default route that so many people get caught in. And if you dig the default route, then God bless you. But yep. uh, you know when you don't dig it and you got to yep. listen to that. Yep. Big time. I agree. Travis House, what is an early experience you can remember and you can define early however you like uh, where you learn that language has power? Oh, yeah. I definitely being a kid, growing up in Kilbride, being small, like I'm a short dude, I'm not imposing whatsoever, which works for hitchhiking, but bullied heavily and figured out pretty quick that with words, You didn't need to always fight. Now I ended up learning how to fight and spending 10 years in martial arts and everything else just to back it up. But it was talking down people who were ready to either, you know, fight me or one of my friends or using ridicule sometimes to take the air out of their balloon. Um, That's when I first realized like, oh, okay, there, there are strategies to employ here that is not all physical based and 
with a, a pretty sharp tongue, you can, you know, you can talk your way out of a lot. And even in foreign countries and stuff where even, you know, they might not even understand your language, your cadence and your body language. And, you know, even without words, you can, you can manipulate people a lot in terms of uh, getting yourself out of danger. You know, what is your work kryptonite if you are if if you're trying to work away at your art and this thing happens the work is now done <laughs> um probably a, a good uh, like documentary on youtube or something that just like i shouldn't even have that tab open when i'm working but every now and then i'll put some music on there and yeah i'm a sucker for like you know is this atlantis so, like a lot of the you know, pseudo intellectual, pseudo scientific, uh, speculative documentaries. I'm a sucker for those. They get me every time. I uh, love that. And, I mean, I'm I'm notoriously distractible, but yeah, I can yeah. get sucked into some stuff. I always wonder if, like, in a thousand years, if anything that we that we've produced modernly is going to be thought of like that. Like, if there's going to be like. Have we discovered Edward Edward Cullen's last grave? I'm like, no, because that's a fictional character. But in a thousand years, they might not realize that. And I feel like just the exponential growth of technology, a thousand years is uh, we might not, I, we might end up wiping ourselves off of uh, the planet's butt, honestly, what? by that time. Planet might be happier for it, but let's, let's. Uh. Oh, listen. Yeah. She, she'll, she grows and she contracts. She knows nothing other than change herself. I love that. There's a wonderful Neil deGrasse Tyson quote where he had to like push back against someone where like they're like, we're trying to save the planet. And he was like, no, no, no. We're trying to save humanity. The planet will be fine. (laughs) Yeah. How arrogant of us. (laughs) Yeah. The planet existed before we're here and will still be there after we're gone and might be better off. It's fascinating how much of a flash in the pan we actually are. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, people get very caught up in, uh, but just in the past 150 years, we're a different, we're almost a different race than what we were, like not anatomically speaking, obviously, but the integration of technology, how we're basically already cyborgs. We all carry around computers in our pocket that we hardly know how to get through the day with. You and I wear you know, our glasses. That's, that's that's another good point. Yeah, that's just cybernetics. I mean, we like once something's been around for long enough, we cease to think of it as technology. But a fork is technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's very true. I, I I find it very. See, this subject has the possibility to bring out the nihilist in me. I like to think that I'm a happy, bouncy person, and sometimes like I'm I'm on these subjects, I'm not. Like, um, um, have you ever looked at like a a 3D representation of population growth over the course of the world. Like, okay, we started here, scientists think, and then you just watch, like, say it's like red dots on the planet Earth spreading out, and you just watch humanity spread. You know what I mean? Like, oh, how mm-hmm. population spread until we're basically everywhere. Then go look at a time lapse video of uh, mold spreading over an orange. Realize it looks about the same. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's uh, it, and then try to convince the mold to not destroy the orange because if it destroys the orange, it itself will die and you can't because the mold's too stupid and that's when you realize it's all people. (laughs) It's fair. That's totally fair. Now, there is another study I read super recently that says uh, population growth is is heavily stagnating and uh, there's this scientist, what's his name? I don't remember, but he was saying this may be the most people on earth for the rest of humanity period like there's there there seems to be i guess it's to the point where a lot less people are having a lot less children but uh he seems to think that uh this might be the most people on earth possibly ever for the rest of humanity's like experience i hope so there's more people alive (laughs) today than there have been through all of history yeah absolutely uh we i hope we've also hit a precipice that being said he he was uh kind of going the other way with it we're like you don't want the fight for humanity's continuation but i think we're uh we're millennia away from that if we like i said if technology doesn't manage to throw us into a dystopian hellhole lovely conversation we're having oh this Um, is what i live for (laughs) yeah yeah travis travis um if magic was real don't get me started don't 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 (laughs) 
don't argue that. We're just if magic was real, and there was a, a a cauldron in front of you in the midst of a spell right now, and you put everything that is your work, your body of work, went into that cauldron, and a flash of light happened, and through that spell, your work as a whole had been transformed into an animal. What animal is popping out of the cauldron? Mm. That's a really good question. Is and it pr- provokes? <laughs> well, it is in the sense that it provokes thought and consideration. Hmm. Man, like part of me wants to say, you know, like a, a a blue jay just for the the freedom aspect of it i like but another part i wants to say like dung beetle dung dung you know technically that's an insult it's an insect (laughs) so you can't right right i can't use the dung beetle (laughs) well some like terribly ugly ugly marsupial that i don't even know or something some underthought animal that would probably be eaten in the streets of some southeast asian country just absolutely indescript I don't know. Like, yeah, it's nice. I love my freedom and that exploration, like adventure and all this other stuff. But in the end, I'm going to die and all these experiences will, uh, you know, will just fade away as well. So it's it's this all for not type of feeling I have about life, which gives me such vibrance for life. Don't mistake me. But uh, yeah, that's hard because I want to be all poetic and, and love that, you know, my work and ex- kind of represents something but uh in representing something it also has to contend with its own finite nature and just understated blah like it's only words it's only experiences i'm not special i don't know i fight with that question a lot travis what's the best money you ever spent on your art on on Whatever it is, it can be anything, it can be a chicken sandwich. As long as in your head, you were like, oh, it's okay. This is for my art. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Um, the ferry ticket off the island. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is, I, I wouldn't be who I am today if I didn't spend so much damn time living out of my backpack in ditches in Canada and the United States and chasing whatever dream I should have at that moment. Um, that's that's me that's what made me me i'd just be a some you know nondescript human being just you know, probably you working des- in would you do decide to eventually go off the grid consider consider all the like newfoundland ghost towns out there where there are just houses and structures that are just there like think of it like think about someone going to what they think is a ghost town and finding you beard down to your ankles <laughs> typewriter thousands of pages of poetry that you've put on like paper that you made yourself while pulping and you're just like <laughs> get out of my office chasing them down the beach not a stitch of clothes on you that's a wonderful story that is that uh that's right up my alley you know especially if i could build it as it is it's tough right because you want to be i'm still young i still want to be close to like what's happening and stuff but uh the older I get, the more and more I realize that uh, I've lived, I've lived that. I've had my fun there and I'm just trying to get a bit of peace out of it. Ellen is trying so hard not to die laughing. Just to <laughs> my right. Yeah. It's just like, what? <laughs> oh my. A beard is nature's loincloth. <laughs> Oh, the wow. other, I wouldn't want to be out there alone. That's the other thing. That was kind of like a, one of the biggest realizations ever after all this time on the road alone. It was just like, you know, that Chris McCandless quote, that end of the wild guy who wrote in his journal right before he died, happiness is nothing unless shared. That hit me so hard that uh, I, I didn't, it almost like took me out. It really did. And I had to learn like, okay, that means I can write poetry to share it and it's not for nothing. But then when we talk about, you know, moving to Outport, Newfoundland, it's like, there's no way I could do that alone and still stay sane, you know, and a dog isn't enough. So yeah, there yeah. still must be a, a human connection after all. Yep. Yep. Okay. 
Travis, what kind of research do you do and how much, how long do you spend researching before working on a project, if at all? Yeah, I guess I don't really, because of what I write, I don't have to research anything uh, other than you, travel routes. And you, know, you could argue that your, your, your entire, like, 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 hitchhiking and traveling and all that stuff is your research you know yeah yeah and i mean before then it was learning a lot about um just survival uh, wilderness survival and such like that because i did spend a lot of my time uh practicing and learning wilderness survival techniques so there's there's a lot of that um, i definitely consider that research and just being on the road every hitchhike ride was research <laughs> it was um the best real taste of humanity anyone could get. You don't get a clue of how the real people think on the ground when you're on Facebook reading everyone's high octane takes on everything under the sun. Um, you That's not people. They would never say that in your to your face or like in front of um, someone who actually has done the research that none of their arguments, you know, you're me. <laughs> sure sure there are exceptions. The, the amount of people who go like, oh, no, you're really like that. Well, I'm like, yes. <laughs> Fear me. <laughs> yeah, there are there certainly there certainly are exceptions, but most people just want to live their life and be nice, and they don't want to uh, tear down the world or uh, build up something utopian or like all this stuff that people get on with online is so funny. And ninety nine percent of the people are not like that, and the. You know, 90% of them don't even vote or do anything with uh, like politically active. So you would never know how these people actually felt They're uh, I like them the most. They're the the forgotten, in my opinion, like politically and, uh, you know, and spiritually and philosophically forgotten. And uh, I don't want to forget them because they're some of the smartest and wisest people I've ever met. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, do uh travis have you ever read anything that made you think differently about your work uh yeah yeah definitely um when i read bukowski specifically that make that gives me almost permission to even be more real than i was trying to be in the first place because i try to be just disgustingly real right off the bat when I write my own stuff, just because it's the closest to my heart. But I, even then I hold back, you know, because I don't deem it per, perhaps a poetic enough angle to take about a subject. But then I read Bukowski. I'm like, Oh no, no, I could be realer than this. I could be more grotesque than this. I can use words that make me nervous. Like this is what art is. It should make you nervous. So yeah, Bukowski gives me permission to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more rough around the edges. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I am very disappointed in you, Travis Houseless. <laughs> Autobiography of Red, man. Of course. What are you, what are you talking about? I did forget about that huge <laughs> revelation that I had about? when I read that. Yeah. Yes. It's only because I'm reading Bukowski now that I say that too. Hey. But yeah, yeah Ann Carlson, that was another one because I was struggling with this idea for this new book about like a, the actual telling of my hitchhiking journey, my very first one. And I've written out 50, 60,000 words of a narrative like five or six years ago. And I hated it. I was like, I don't like my voice. I don't like all these rules and conventions. I don't know anything. I never really went to school. So I was like, oh, as soon as I read autobiography, I read, I realized that I could just do what I wanted and <laughs> write yep. a poem instead of a, you know, a huge book. Cause I mean, that's the most difficult thing anybody can undertake, like props to you. And, every author in existence who actually writes a book because it is soul crushingly difficult. I realized I am encroaching on a million words in print. Oh my God, Matthew. Congratulations, yeah. brother. I'm yeah. very sorry to hear that. <laughs> I, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, Travis House, thank you again for coming on the program. It is a pleasure to have you. Uh, everyone, you can check out Travis's wonderful poetry in the books. All I brought back uh, and Peace Be the Journey, uh, and his individual poems that you can purchase for any price are available every week at the St. John's Farmer's Market. Thank you for joining us, Travis. Thank you so much, Matthew. I really appreciate it. No problem at all.
All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.